Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, reading through verse 16, a nice, succinct, primary passage today. The word of the Lord reads from the King James text. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hallelujah. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, when we fall short. When we fall short. And then in parentheses I have the words, grace abounds. Hallelujah. When we fall short, grace abounds. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for this time in your presence. We thank you for the wonderful old hymns and songs of the church. There is no greater joy than worshiping our God. There is no greater place to be than in the presence of the Lord. As the word of God at this moment must go forth, we ask God that you would anoint the messenger. Lord, you call mere feeble men. You call those of us who possess nothing more than feet of clay to bear the good news of the gospel of the kingdom to a lost and dying world. You call us to be an encouragement and inspiration to believers and saints. You call us, Lord, to instruct the people of God in the way of truth and in the paths of righteousness. And Lord, all of this is a great responsibility. It is a great calling. And there is no possible way any human being could do what you have called me this hour to do except that we be anointed of the Holy Ghost. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost flow. Right now, God, like a river through this place, touch my body, touch my mind, touch my lips, that I might speak, Lord, today the right word at the right time, that the people of God might be nourished and fed, uplifted, and inspired thereby. Master, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our faith can only grow and be nurtured when we hear the Word of the Lord. Oh, Master, help me today to preach the Word of the Lord. Not man-made dogma, not man-made doctrine, but the Word of God. That the people of God might be nourished thereby. We ask it all in none other than Jesus precious, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I remember when I first came back to church after being out for a few years, I had come out and of course I was convinced that I had no place in God, I had no place in the church. Uh, you know, I'd been called every kind of name uh, by ministers in the Pentecostal church. I, I've been cussed. I had the F word thrown at me by Pentecostal pastors. And I became convinced that I was something filthy and wretched and unlovable and undesirable and God 
wanted nothing in the universe to do with me. So I left the church behind and I went out into the world and I had never been in the world. I was raised in a Pentecostal spirit-filled full gospel church. I've never been in the world. I didn't know that people would lie to you and use you and people would uh, be deceitful and that people for the sake of their own lust and their own desires would tell you whatever you wanted to hear and they could have their way with you and then they would discard you like yesterday's rubbish. I didn't know that. had no idea. I was raised to say what you mean and mean what you say. So when I said something, I meant it. And, and I didn't play people like that. I didn't do people like that. But boy, howdy, I learned fast. As many of us do when we go out in the world. Boy, you learn real fast. A lot of users, a lot of people out there that have no conscience whatsoever. They get what they want to get at your expense and they really have no interest at all in how hurt you might be. I'm going to tell you something. Those of you folks out of church and you say, well, people in the church have hurt me and people in the church have done me dirty. Um, sweetheart, don't tell me people in the world are doing you better. Hello now. Now all you're doing is, all you're doing is trading your heartache. All you're doing is changing which team you're playing on. But you're still going through a lot of hurt. You're still going through a lot of disappointment. You still have people abusing you and mistreating you. Am I telling the truth today? All the difference is now you're out in the world. You say, well, but yeah, in the world I don't expect any better. In the church I expect better. And that's why I'd rather be out in the world. Oh, okay, so you'd rather be out there being abused and mistreated because after all, that's how people out there do. I'm going to tell you something. I've been a part of a lot of churches in my life, and I have never been part of a church in my life where everybody in the church was a hypocrite, and everybody in the church was no good, and everybody in the church hurt me, and everybody in the church abused me. There ain't one single church I've ever been part of where I could say that. Mm -hmm. No, most of the time, the people that hurt you and abuse you and mistreat you are in the minority for the most part. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Amen. So there's a lot of good. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. Don't discard the benefits of God's church and the fellowship of God's people because of the few bad apples that happen to be in the basket. But I'm going to tell you, when the Lord worked with me and talked to me from the first day, the first day, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I've talked about it before. The first time I was going into an establishment that catered to the LGBT community, and I was just, my, I spent my whole life thinking I was the only person on the planet who felt the way I felt, you know. And I was looking forward to maybe meeting some people who could understand me and who felt like I did. And, you know, and I was nervous. I was beyond nervous. I was flat scared going into this club, nightclub, you know. And... Uh, I was getting out of my car and I was walking toward the door of this nightclub and I kid you not, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me just as real as God has ever spoken to me in my life. And He spoke to my heart and said, you could help these people. And I said, Lord, I could help them what? He said, you could help them understand that my grace is sufficient for them as well. I understand them. I get them. There is nothing about who you are that is a surprise to me. There is nothing about who you are that is offensive to me. The only thing I find offensive is unbelief. When people choose not to have faith and choose not to believe in me. He said that I find offensive, but I understand you. I get you. 
And I'll never forget it because here I was walking into the Copacabana in New Haven, Connecticut. And I said, Lord, I can't help these folks understand that because I don't even believe that. That was my final word on this. Stuff. I don't even believe that. Took about three years or so. But the Lord kept working on me. He kept working on me. He kept working on me. Finally, the person that I was in a relationship with uh, during a little respite, during a little breakup that we, we went through every year, we had this little breakup. It was an annual event. And during that period of time, he had heard me talking so much about how I missed God and I missed the church and I missed miracles and I missed healings and I miss seeing people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and I miss the move of God and all these things. And he was born and raised Roman Catholic, didn't know what on earth I was talking about. And during the time when he and I were separated, he began to attend a Jesus name, apostolic, one God, Holy Ghost filled church in Brooklyn, New York. He heard the message of Acts 2.38 and he believed it. He obeyed it. He was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. He received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then when we wound up getting together uh, after that he told me that he had done this and I was in a pickle. Man, I was in a bad spot. Lord, what am I going to do now? Either I'm going to have to break up with this because I'm not going back to church. I'm not going to have nothing to do with church. Or I'm going to have to act right and I'm going to have to find some kind of way to serve you. Because all I knew was I was not going to cost him his salvation. I was not going to be party to contributing to his backsliding and his falling away. Now that he had begun a journey with the Lord, I was not about. I feared God. Not, not I wasn't afraid of God, but I feared God. Meaning, you know, I reverenced God enough that I knew I, I could not put his salvation at risk all because I didn't want to act right and I didn't want to go back to church and stuff. And uh, I said, all right, Lord, you got me. He knew, so I'm going to tell you, God knows how to get you, friend. You can fight the Lord all you want to. There are some people listening to the sound of my voice right now. And you made up your mind, I'm never going back to church. I'm never going to walk back into a church again so long as I live. I'm going to tell you something, honey, you don't want to say that. God's a big God. He loves you. He wants you. You're His child. He hasn't given up on you. You may have given up on Him, but He hasn't given up on you. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. He has ways of convincing you that it might be a better idea to get back where you ought to be. Bible said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He'll lift you up. I'm going to tell you something. You'd rather humble yourself than be humbled. You don't want the Lord to humble you. You'd rather come back voluntarily than wait until circumstances force you to have to come back. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you. I want to tell you the Lord cares about you. He loves you. He, he, when you made a decision to live for Him however many years ago, honey, He made a commitment to you that day. The Word of God says that the Lord... Our God is married to the backslider. He's married. You may be separated, but you're still married. <laughs> well, when Jason came into the church and all of a sudden I was faced with having to make a decision what to do, I said, well, maybe we can just sneak into a church somewhere and be, you know, just go to church somewhere and, and, and you know, uh, kind of just mingled with the number. We went to a couple of mega churches there in the New York City area where we were living. And uh, I, I didn't feel like God was in any of those churches enough for me to want to be there because I know what the move of God looks like. 
Long story short, I realized after a while that if we were going to have a church, we were going to have to start a church. I was going to have to start a church. So I started working on uh, trying to figure out how in the world I could start a ministry that would reach out to everybody, not just LGBT people, everybody, but that would have a very purposeful, constructive, uh, efficient outreach to the LGBT community to help people in that community who had been ostracized and set aside and uh, abused by the church to help them find their way back to a walk with the Lord. And I began to do a lot of writing and I began to do a lot of research and I began to do a lot of study. And I would not look at one single book, not one single article, not a page. First of all, when I started, I didn't even have the internet. Uh, I, the internet was something I pursued after I started affirming ministry as a means of reaching out to our community. But in the beginning, I didn't even have the internet at all. So I just took my Bible and I began to search the scriptures. I began to look at every passage that dealt with the issue of LGBT people and every, what they often refer to as clobber passages, you know. There aren't that many. There's actually less than about half a dozen in the entire Bible. The Bible talks more about divorce and remarriage, and it talks more about that than it does uh, anything that touches upon the LGBT. But I remember I was talking to the Lord one day, and I said, Lord, where do I begin? Where do I start? And He spoke to me just so clearly. He said, don't start at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't start at Romans chapter 1. Don't start in Leviticus. He said, no, you need to start not on a passage, but you need to start on a subject. And I said, well, Lord, what subject do I need to start on? He said, you need to start on grace. You need to study grace. You need to look at the issue of grace. The church has perverted and twisted and poisoned the doctrine of grace to such a degree today that it is not even anywhere near what it ought to be. So I began to do an extensive study on the subject of grace. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. What I learned in that study, I wound up writing my study out, and it was something to the effect of 40 or 50 pages. It was a, could have written a book on it. The things I learned about grace, the things I found out about grace. When I was growing up as a kid, my grandmother, a Pentecostal lady, Holy Ghost filled lady. She, she had one little phrase that she loved to use constantly. Every time she'd get upset or aggravated or frustrated over something, she'd say, Lord, give me grace. God, give me grace. Lord, give me grace. And Grandma used to constantly you know, cry out, God give me grace. And, and so many Christians talk about grace and they refer to grace as though it is the answer to all kinds of issues and to all kinds of problems and, and it's the answer to all kinds of situations. But what people don't understand is grace is God's answer to sin. It is not His answer when you need patience. It is not His answer when you need the Lord to help you love somebody that you're finding unlovable or difficult to love. Grace is not something that you need when you lose your patience or when you're tired. That is not where grace comes in. Grace is God's answer to sin. It is God's answer to the fall of man. It is God's answer to our inability as human 
beings to live up to his standard of perfection and true holiness. The law was not grace. The law of Moses that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai was designed, the word of the Lord tells us, to be a school teacher. It was supposed to teach us something so that when grace came, we would follow after it and latch hold of it and cling to it with all of our might because the law showed us what it is to be under an authoritarian rule and to be in a place where the only hope you have is to follow all the rules. Not some of them, not most of them, not the majority of them, but all the rules. The law was designed in such a fashion that if you were to break one single point of the law, According to God's law, you had broken them all. There was no such thing as big sin, little sin. Got news for you folks. There's no such thing as big sin, little sin. Those people who run around trying to tell you that this sin is bigger than that sin. And that these people are bigger sinners than those people. They are full of baloney. To break one point of the law is to have broken them all. And I'm going to share a scripture with you shortly that will uh, explain this to you. But grace was God's answer to sin. So that by the time grace arrived, we would know that there is no possible way we can live up to the mandates and the dictates of the law. It's just not possible. And coming to that understanding, we ought to welcome grace with open arms. We ought to be so grateful for the mercy and the grace of God that brings salvation without our having to earn it, without our having to do anything to be deserving of it. But boy, I'm going to tell you one thing I've learned in studying grace. If there is any doctrine, if there is any subject that human beings <laughs> cannot wrap their mind around, it's grace. See, grace is a divine attribute. It's not a human attribute. Humans tend to give what they get. You know, we talk about unconditional love. I'm going to tell you something. Husbands and wives love each other conditionally. Mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, parents and children, siblings love one another conditionally. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. Most of us, if you stop and think about it long enough, you know that there's something that mom and dad knew this about me, boy, they'd, be, they'd cut me off, they wouldn't want nothing to do with me, they would act like I was never born, like I was never there. So am I telling the truth? Because their love and the expression of their love, the extension of their love, is based upon your pleasing them. And you're doing things in such a way that they're happy with the way you're doing it. Am I telling the truth? Well, I'm telling you, in my family, when I came out, my God Almighty, I have all kinds of aunts and uncles and grandma and all kind of people who all of a sudden treated me like garbage. They loved me to death when I was in church, struggling. They loved me to death when I was going through years of depression. They loved me to death when I was suicidal because I was so lonely and in such a state of despair and confusion, all because of something inside of me that I had no more control over. 
than the color of my eyes. Boy, I found out real quick how quick they could turn on me when conditions changed. No, human beings, we, we tend to be very conditional in how we deal with people. You treat me right, I'll treat you right. If I have a nickel for every time I see somebody online who posts a meme or posts a saying, you know, say, as long as you treat me good, I'll treat you good. That's not grace. No, grace is unmerited. It's unearned. It's undeserved favor. It's when you show somebody kindness and mercy and love and compassion when they have done a thing in the bloody universe to deserve it. That's grace. Grace is a divine attribute. This is why the gospel begins with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. Grace is born of love. See, the interesting thing about God is God doesn't love. As in love as a verb. God doesn't love. No, no. Listen to me, children. The word of the Lord declares, Jesus himself spoke the words, God is love. That changes everything. It doesn't say God loves. It says God is love. The very nature of the Spirit of God is love. Out of that love came grace unearned favor unmerited favor God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves and we did nothing we do nothing to deserve it if and when we get to heaven listen to me children we will have never ever done anything to deserve it. Heaven will not be our reward because of something we, that, that we've done or something that we have been able to accomplish. No. When we pass through the pearly gates and lay our eyes upon the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and see him as he is. We will do so for one reason and one reason only. Because of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, 19 through 21. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Adam's disobedience made everybody that came behind him a sinner. Hello now. You didn't have to do anything to be a sinner. Oh my God. Adam did what he did and that marked us all. Ooh, I'm going to get happy. Jesus did what he did, hallelujah, and by faith in the gospel, we become a partaker of his righteousness, and it marks us all, hallelujah to God. We don't have to do anything to be righteous in the eyes of God any more than a person born after Adam had to do anything to be seen as a sinner. You hear what I'm telling you now? So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, the law was given so that we might know what it was that offended God. What it was 
that we ought not to be doing. Listen, but where sin abounded, not where impatience abounded, not where hatred abounded, not where anger abounded, no, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah! Because grace is God's answer to sin. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, I'm going to tell you in our primary text today, the Apostle Paul told the Hebrew church, he said, you know, we've got a high priest, but we don't have a high priest that serves down here on planet earth. Hallelujah. We have a high priest who sits in heaven. Glory to God. And he said, but not only do we have a high priest that sits in heaven, he said, but the high priest that we have is not one who cannot feel, listen to me children, who cannot feel what we feel he said that which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities he can feel what we feel he can be touched by the feelings. Oh my goodness. Infirmities. You remember I talked to you before about infirmities and what infirmities means? I think just last Sunday I talked about it. Said it's the natural, uh, the natural difficulties, the natural struggles that we go through in life, okay? Uh, infirmities is not about uh, additional troubles and struggles that are put upon you by people or by the enemy or by anybody or anything else. No, infirmities are just the natural byproduct of human living. We go through depression. We go through sadness. We go through grief. We go through mourning. We go through any number of emotional stages. And it's all simply part of life. And all of those things are infirmities. Meaning, they are natural things that being a human being, we must experience. And we must go through. They are things that can destroy us. They are things that can lay us down. They they are things that can delay us. They are things that can cause us tremendous heartbreak and trouble. And our high priest understands how every one of those things feels. Oh, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My Lord, have mercy. Aren't you glad? Aren't you? You know, preachers love to get up in pulpits. I, I grew up in a church, you know, and I always looked at the pastor like he was next best thing to Jesus, you know. I always thought the pastor was just so perfect, and you know, that the reason he was preaching is because he had it all together, and he knew how to live for the Lord like nobody's business, and you know, he could do what nobody in the church could do, bless God. That's why God called him to lead, because he can do it better until the Lord called me to preach, and all of a sudden I realized, Lord, what's wrong with you? You're calling imperfect people. You're calling somebody that doesn't to do everything just right and can't do this thing perfect. And as I got older and got to know more and more preachers, I began to realize one to one of them that was perfect, one to one of them that did everything right. Mm -hmm. But boy, they sure do like to make you think that's the case, don't they? Mm -hmm. Got news for you, children. Our high priest does not want you to think for one minute that he doesn't know how you feel. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. Our high priest does not for one minute want you to think that he does not understand what you feel. Says how, 
How is it that he's able to be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? Because he was tempted in all points like as we. Meaning, he had to deal with and respond to depression and despair all the negativities of human emotion, all the infirmities of living life as a human being, disappointment, struggle, he knew every one of those experiences. That's how come he understands. That's how come our God is able to say to you, honey, I understand where you're coming from. I understand what you're experiencing. I understand how you feel. You know, sometimes we look at something and say, how can you understand? You can't understand what I'm going through unless you've been there. And Jesus says, yep, there you go. Been there. Done it. Hallelujah. I felt it. I've experienced it. But in every circumstance... He never once responded in a manner that contradicted faith. Yet without sin. Oh my goodness. No matter what came at him, no matter what hit him, no matter what struggle, what infirmity he had to deal with, not once did he react or respond in a way that could be classified as an offense to God. Mm. Oh my goodness. Yet without sin. Then the Apostle Paul says in verse 16, Let us therefore, because we have a high priest who understands our infirmity, who understands our feelings, who understands what we go through in this life, he said, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, considering grace is God's response to sin, <laughs> then uh, what would constitute a time of need? When we sin. Not when we lose patience. Not when we're angry. Not when we're tired. Not when we're hungry. Not when we can't find it in our heart to love somebody. No, 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 no. That's not what grace is there for. No. No. Grace is God's response to sin. So if we can come boldly to the Lord in time of need to find grace, then the only time we need to come to the Lord to find grace is when we have sin. You follow me now? Oh my goodness, have mercy. Oh my word, have mercy. Oh, you mean when we fall short, grace abounds. <laughs> when we fall short we have access to grace God's grace is there continually we can rely upon it we can count on it we can know that it is there not only can we know that it's there but we do not have to come sheepishly or shyly to the throne of grace but rather we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help and uh, to help in time of need in Ephesians 2 4 through 10 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace 
in His kindness toward us through, Je through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nobody's going to stand before God in heaven and say, I'm in heaven because I didn't cut my hair. I'm in heaven because I wore long sleeves. I'm in heaven because I only wear white shirts. I'm in heaven because I followed all these rules and I did all that. No, 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 honey. Uh-uh. Wrong. Wrong. You're in heaven. If you make heaven, it'll be by the grace of God and it'll be by the grace of God alone. In 1 John 1, 7 through 10, the Apostle John writes, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now listen to what John says. If we say that we have no sin, now he's talking about people who are walking in the light. He's not talking about unbelievers now. He's talking about the church. He said if we, if we, if we, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is probably the least read passage in the entire Bible in fundamentalist and evangelical churches. You will not hear them use this passage correctly. If they use it at all, they will try to twist it and pervert it. They will try to tell you that this is in reference to unbelievers. If an unbeliever says they have not sinned, they're making God, no, 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 honey. Uh -uh. No. John said if we Remember what I've told you when I've been teaching on studying the Bible and understanding the writings of the apostles and uh, God's uh, anointed leadership. Whenever they use phraseology, we, us, that refers to the church. Whenever they use they, them, that refers to the unbelieving world. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, John was not talking about the world. He was talking about the church. He said, if we say, if we say, if we believers, if we come talking, Holy Ghost baptized, Jesus' name, fire-filled believers claim we have no sin, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, meaning simply, if we acknowledge that we're sinners, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh my Lord, I'm going to tell you, you know what's going to make the difference between heaven and hell for a lot of people? You know what's going to make, yes, I believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Yes, I do. You know what's going to make the difference for a lot of people? Right here. It's going to be whether or not they place their faith and their confidence in the grace of God or whether or not they could not buy into the concept of grace 
And they still insisted that they had to do something to earn salvation. That they, if they didn't toe the line, if they didn't do everything just right, if they weren't just perfect, they were going to miss heaven. Those people are going to miss heaven. Did you hear what I just said? If you've convinced yourself, honey, that you are capable of missing heaven because of something you do or something you say, if you've convinced yourself that salvation is not a gift from God, it is not solely, entirely, completely based upon the grace of God, if you've convinced yourself that somehow, some way, you must work your way into heaven, then I've got news for you. You're going to miss heaven. I don't live right. I don't live a godly life. I don't strive to live a holy life in order to earn heaven. I do so out of gratitude for what God has done for me by grace. Hallelujah. I do so as a way of saying, Lord, you forgave me. You, uh, you, by your grace, you wiped away my sin in your eyes. You look at me as though I'm holy. You look at me as though I'm pure. You look at me as though I am already, already ready for heaven. I've already gone through the rapture. I've already been changed from corruptible to incorruption. You look at me as though I'm already that which you have promised to one day make me. And you've done that by sheer love and grace. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful that, Lord, I, I'm going to do everything in my power to act right. I'm going to do everything in my power to live right. I'm going to do everything in my power to be a witness to a lost and dying world. I'm going to do everything in my power to live a godly, holy life. Not so that I can earn heaven because, Lord, if I think for one second, listen carefully what the preacher is about to say. If I think for one second that my actions and my deeds are essential to my salvation, I have just discounted the value of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. It wasn't sufficient. It wasn't good enough. Nope. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't good enough to get all of humanity into heaven. No sirree, but it wasn't good enough because we still have to follow all the rules. We still have to do everything right. We still can't make a single mistake. We still can't slip and fall. You have just said that the sacrifice of the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary has little value. Did you hear what I said? But when you come to God and you say, Lord, everything that I do, I do in appreciation for what you did at Calvary. Everything I do, trying to live right, trying to act right, trying to behave right, trying to be a witness, trying to be a testimony. I'm not doing it to earn heaven, Lord. I'm doing it out of gratitude. I'm doing it out of thanksgiving. What's happening when you say that? You are elevating the value of what he did on the cross. Oh my God, have mercy. When you try to live right, when you try to live holy, when you try to live godly, when you try to follow the rules the best you can out of gratitude for what the Lord did at Calvary, what are you saying? You're saying what He did at Calvary is worth far more than merely saving my soul. Hallelujah. It is deserving of my appreciation. It is deserving of my 
my thanksgiving. It is deserving of my praise. And I'm going to thank him and praise him every day of my life in the way I live, in the way I walk, in the way I talk. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? It's all about perspective. It's all in how you see this thing. In Romans 11 and 6, the Word of God declares, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What is the Apostle Paul telling us in Romans 11 and 6? It's very simple. It's very simple, folks. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Grace and works cannot live in the same room. You cannot apply rules and regulations, laws and mandates alongside of grace and claim that the two work together. I spent years of my life in the holiness movement trying to tell people that works, oh my Lord, living up to certain standards was essential to salvation and that this somehow worked in conjunction with the grace of God. Wrong. Wrong, wrong. I preached the wrong message. Works and grace cannot abide in the same space. It's either one or the other. In James chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, almost done today, the apostle, or excuse me, the Lord's brother James writes, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point he is guilty of all for he that said do not commit adultery said also do not kill now if thou commit no adultery yet if thou kill thou art become a transgressor of the law. One thing that I did as part of my studies and part of my research over the years, I have studied some of the great rabbinical teachers, not only of modern times, but also of ancient times. And it's very interesting to me in reading some of the rabbis, their approach to LGBT people, for instance, they say, do we allow LGBT people to be part of the community of faith in the Jewish uh, synagogue, in the Jewish faith? Said, absolutely we do. Absolutely. Said, we do not stand at the door and say, no, you cannot come in. He said, how could we do that? Because according to the law, to offend at one point, you've broken all of them. He said, and the bottom line is, there ain't a one of us that doesn't break the law somewhere. Now they use the term Torah. See, there's, there's not somewhere in our life that we're not breaking Torah. There is not somewhere in our life that we are not doing things as we ought to be doing them. Therefore, how hypocritical and stupid and foolish would it be for us to stand at the door of the synagogue and say, No, you break Torah in this area. Therefore, you can't be part of this community of faith. He said, we can't do that. We can't do that. Got news for you. We can't do that in the church either and God never called us to. Mm -hmm. God never called His people to run around policing themselves. God never called His people to run around rooting up folks and setting people aside and ostracizing people 
and treating people as though they're not part of God's family. Nowhere in Scripture, nowhere, I'm going to tell you something, you have to torture the Word of God to try to make it say that it's okay to treat people like this. Jesus said over and over again, he taught on a number of occasions, so let the wheat grow up with the tares, didn't he? Mm -hmm. said, when the time comes and the harvest is gathered, he said, then the tares will be set aside and destroyed, didn't he? Mm -hmm. said, but he'll be the one to do it. Got news for you, honey. God never called you to ask a gay man to leave your church because you don't like what you perceive as his sin. You moron, you've got garbage in your life that causes you to break Torah. You've got art issues in your life that are offensive to God. And there is no such thing as big sin, small sin. There is no such thing as great sin or, or uh, slight sin. No, to offend at one point is to offend at all. The Apostle Paul said, you sit in judgment of others. He said, and yet you do the same thing, didn't he? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lastly, today in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, stand fast, therefore, Paul writes to the Galatians. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He was talking about the law. The belief that works were essential to salvation. That there were rules and regulations you had to follow. And without following those rules and regulations, you would miss your eternal reward. The Apostle Paul continues, verse 2, Galatians 5. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Listen, he's talking to believers. He's talking to Gentile believers. And there are Jewish Christians who are trying to convince the Gentile believers that they must follow the mandates of the law. Even though God's grace is what saves us, you still have to follow the mandates of the law. And therefore you must be circumcised. And Paul said, listen, Paul said, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He said, the minute you think. Oh, I hope you're hearing me today, folks. The minute you think that your works and your actions are essential to your salvation, and that Christ alone and the sacrifice on the cross was not alone sufficient. He said, the minute you do something thinking it's going to add to what Christ did for you on the cross, he said, guess what? It's as if you've never been to the cross. It's as if you never were converted. He said, Christ shall profit you nothing. He didn't say, oh, Christ shall profit you less. He didn't say, Christ shall profit you little. No, he said, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, listen, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. The minute you think Somebody comes to you, LGBT believer, and says, you can't be a Christian because Leviticus says this. Um, you wanna, if you want to live thinking that the law is incumbent upon your salvation, you go right on the head and you believe that. And guess what, honey? I'll see you in hell because you ain't going to make heaven because Christ will profit you nothing. 
I don't buy into that. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, my answer to people when they come to me with that trash is, honey, if you won't believe that, go right on ahead and believe it. You won't make heaven, I will. Thank you. I believe in God. I'm trusting His promises. I'm putting my confidence in His grace. Hallelujah. I don't think I'm going to make heaven because I'm straight. I don't think I'm going to make heaven because I'm this or I'm that or I do this or I do that or I do this right or I do that right. No. I believe that heaven is mine for the taking by the grace of God. Hallelujah. And there isn't a thing in the world I could do that could add to what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me Amen. at Calvary. Again, I read Galatians 5 and 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Hey, LGBT believer, every time somebody comes to you and tries to quote Leviticus to you, do you know what they're doing? They are literally bringing condemnation down upon their own head. Because by suggesting that the law and obedience to the law is essential to salvation, listen to me, folks, they are making themselves subject to the entire law. Every single rule of the law. Think about that. How many LGBT people have left church because somebody come at them pushing uh, law? Mm -hmm. How many have left? And sweetheart, if you understand those same people, all they're doing is heaping condemnation down upon their own head. You know why? They don't get grace. They don't understand that when we fall short, grace abounds. Listen. For I testify again, I keep reading this over and over. I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Listen, verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. How do you fall from grace? By sinning? No, because where sin abounds, grace even more abounds. God's answer to sin is grace. So it's not by sinning that you fall from grace. No, no, no. It's by thinking you got to do something to earn heaven that makes you fall from grace. It's by thinking that the law has something to do with your salvation that makes you fall from grace. Oh my Lord, have mercy. You see why I said? It's going to be a whole lot of people in hell that say, oh, but I was a believer. I was a Christian. I went to church. Yeah, the whole time you believed that the law was essential to your salvation. And according to the Apostle Paul to the church at Galatia, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Oh my Lord, have mercy. It's not about living up to it now. No, we're going to fall short in this life. As long as we're in a human body, we're going to fall short. He said, but by faith we wait for the hope of of righteousness. We look forward to the day when our righteousness will be made complete. Hallelujah. It will be made a reality for us. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And love is what gives birth to grace. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you folks, when we fall short, grace abounds. Hallelujah.